and it is important that uh, the system change begins in the parliament with lawmakers who are responsible for this country. Have we achieved this? Not at all. The only thing that has happened is that uh, the person occupying the presidential chair has changed. President Gotabe Rajapaksa, whatever his faults, was elected by 6.9 million people, so he had legitimacy. Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa was chased away from the country and he was replaced by Mr. Rani Vikramasinghe. That is all that has happened. The government that continues is precisely the same government. With a dominant port to a membership, the port to a majority is in a position to control the presidency. The president has no party or group of his own in parliament. He cannot make independent decision. And anything that he says or does is subject to control by the party. Given the current context, do you think the people's voice should be heard? And do you suggest that we go for an election? Yes, we should definitely should go for an election because the present parliament lacks legitimacy. You said that there's an invisible hand controlling the SLPP. What, what should the people know about this? Welcome everyone, you're watching Conversations with Alanki. Barack Obama said that nothing can stand in the way of the power of millions of voices calling for change. This reminds me of the Aragalia, the people's protest, calling for a corruption-free country, for accountability and transparency. Have we achieved all these things? Have we achieved a system change? Joining me today in Conversations with Alanki is Professor G.L. Pires. Welcome, Mr. Pires. Thank you. Um, it is, Mr. Pires, as we begin this conversation, I thought the focus would be on, on a system change. People demanded a system change. Mm -hmm. And it is important that uh, the system change begins in the parliament with lawmakers who are responsible for this country. Have we achieved this? Not at all. I don't want to sound uh, cynical, but I just consider for a moment the degree of enthusiasm there was, the fervor on the, on the part of young people in particular who demanded a system change. There was great creativity in terms of the works of art they produce, sculpture, they had a small cinema there, a theatre, library, right? So it had the flavour, the quality of the Renaissance. They wanted um, a deep-seated change in political culture, in values that would be reflected in our basic institutions. That was the aim. That's where it all began. Of course, uh, at a certain point, it was hijacked by other forces. It led to violence, which cannot be condoned by any method at all. However, where have we ended up? What has been the total upshot of it on the ground? The only thing that has happened is that uh, the person occupying the presidential chair has changed. President Gotabe Rajapaksa, whatever his faults, was elected by 6.9 million people. So he had legitimacy whatever else he did not have. But he was driven away not only from the presidency, but from Sri Lanka. He had to leave the country. So Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa was chased away from the country and he was replaced by Mr. Rani Vikramasinghe. That is all that has happened. The government that continues is precisely the same government with a dominant uh, port to a membership. Uh, the port to a majority is in a position to control the presidency. The president has no party or group of his own in parliament. He cannot make independent decisions. And anything that he says or does is subject to control by the port to and by the people who control the port to Now, uh, former president Mahindra Rajapaksa said in his speech in Kalutara, that uh, he didn't say it in so many words, but uh, the gist of what he said, the true meaning of it is that uh, Mr. Rani Vikramasinghe has taken membership of the port. He said, Ranil was earlier subject to very severe criticism by the Rajapaksas, but now the Rajapaksas embrace him with great affection and that they have been able to bring him to the right path. So, according to former President Mahindra Rajapaksa, 
Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe has espoused the policies of the SLPP and he is now implementing the policies of the SLPP. Is that the change that people expected? Is that the system change that all these young people uh, had uh, so much uh, keenness for? So I think it has been a damn squib and uh, unfortunately a total anticlimax. I did watch one of your interviews um, earlier this month where you said that there's an invisible hand controlling the SLPP. What, what should the people know about this? I, I, I think the people know already what they need to know. It is quite obvious uh, who is controlling the SLPP. The SLPP controls parliament. And somebody at the moment outside the country is controlling the SLPP. I don't think that that is a desirable state of affairs and nor is it in conformity with basic constitutional values. Now, there has been so much criticism of the executive presidency on the ground that um, its power is overwhelming, overarching. Right. And that it has a chilling effect on all other institutions, including parliament, uh, the cabinet, the public service, all of this. Now, all that is correct. But the fact remains that the presidency is an integral part of the constitution. It operates within the frame of Sri Lanka's highest law, which is the constitution. So although the president has a, a very considerable volume of authority, he is accountable to parliament for the manner in which he performs those functions. That is clearly set out in the constitution. But if you have an invisible hand controlling the Porto and the Porto in turn controls parliament, then the objections to that state of things, in my view, are far more fundamental in terms of accountability. You know, if somebody is in that position, they wield enormous power. They control the president of the country, mm -hmm. but they are not accountable to anybody in the world. They are law unto themselves. I think that is a situation that is destructive of basic democratic norms and values. Is this why you decided to be an independent member in parliament? Yes, because it became very clear that the, uh, the people who now control the port tour are acting in a manner that is directly contrary to the promises we gave the people when we campaigned for the parliamentary elections of August 2020. Mm -hmm. I went all over the country with uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa, who was the leader of the party. I was the chairman of the party. So we both addressed the people together from every major political platform in the country, in all the districts of the country. We went to each district. Now, when we look back on what we told the people, we laid before them a clear program of work and agenda. We did not ask for a blank check, nor did we receive a blank check. We told the people in explicit terms, this is what we propose to do during the next five years if you elect us. The result was a tsunami. The people elected the Pohotua in resounding numbers. 143 out of 225 members of parliament, not to do anything at all that we wanted to do, but faithfully to carry out the program of work for which we obtained the endorsement of the people. So we received a mandate. Now that mandate has been flagrantly and cynically breached. We made it stand on its head. We said that the policies of the United National Party are not appropriate for this country. We should reject those policies and instead implement a different set of policies which we expounded at great length in uh, Mr. Godave Rajapaksa's uh, election manifesto, Saubhagya Dakma, Visions of Splendor and Prosperity, and all the speeches that we made, the leadership of our party. Now, we have distorted all of that. Right? That is a clear violation of the contract that we made with the people of our country who elected us and it got to a point when we felt that we could no longer be part of that exercise. So we therefore broke away 
formed an independent group within the SLPP. We haven't left the SLPP. And our consistent position has been that it is we who represent the identity, the value systems and the philosophy of the SLPP. Not the people who have made the SLPP a tail of the UNP. That was never the policy of the SLPP. That is not what we told the people. Had we told the people in August 2020 that we, what we intend to do in the end is to join the UNP and to form a government together, do you think we would have got 10 seats? They were 143, not at all. Now, when we went to Anuradhapura, we, we were greeted with the bizarre spectacle of roundabouts in Anuradhapura decorated with flags of two colors. The port was the Sataka color and the UNP color. Half was port to half was Sataka color, half was green. Now, many of our members in Anuradhapura said, uh, this is a very strange spectacle which we never expected. How can we go to our villagers and ask our supporters to team up with the UNP? This is contrary to everything that we believed in. So it is a fundamental contradiction and that is the basic reason why we decided to take the decisive step which we did. Given the current context, do you think the people's voice should be heard and do you suggest that we go for an election? Yes, we should definitely we should go for an election because the present parliament lacks legitimacy. It was elected in August 2020 but so much water has flowed under the bridge since then. As I said earlier, for the first time in our history, an elected president was driven away from the country by the people. Right? And parliament is today a debased currency. Uh, it is like uh, a product which has uh, uh, the, the, its shelf life has expired. Mm -hmm. Because when, if you sit in parliament and listen to the debates there, it is a different world. It has a kind of Alice in Wonderland quality. It is far, far removed from the reality on the ground in the country at large. You know, public opinion on the ground and what is said and done in parliament are two entirely different things. Right? So therefore, what you need is a parliament which reflects public opinion, a mirror of public opinion. That is important at all times. It is particularly important today when we are grappling with, uh, you know, uh, far-reaching changes, negotiations with the International Monetary Fund, which is resulting uh, in major fiscal changes, new taxes. Uh, then uh, we are now uh, trying to introduce the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, we are trying to bring about a basic change in the political culture, culture of the country. These are things that are going to affect future generations. So it is absolutely essential that these things must be done by a parliament which is truly representative of public opinion in the country. I don't think anybody with their ear to the ground can possibly maintain that the present parliament fulfills that criteria and it is certainly not reflective of current public opinion and therefore the parliamentary election, I think, is a need of the hour. Uh, Professor, you did mention uh, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution. Do you think it is sufficient to bring about the reforms needed? It is not ideal, but uh, it is an improvement on the 20th Amendment. So you, you have to proceed incrementally. If you can't achieve the ideal, then I think it would be a good thing to accept uh, changes which improve the situation substantially. So our position is that the 22nd uh, Amendment contains many beneficial features uh, and uh, I think the right attitude to take is that we are prepared to support it subject to certain conditions. There cannot be committee stage amendments which completely distort the meaning and substance of the 22nd Amendment. That has happened in the past, as you would recall, with regard to the uh, bill in respect of provincial council elections, for instance. So there cannot be last minute amendments brought at the committee stage, which serve narrow political or personal interests. We are against that. But if what we are asked to vote on is the current text of the 22nd Amendment, uh, with whatever changes have been recommended by the Supreme Court, uh, 
then these have come through the Attorney General, the bill has been seen by the Attorney General. So the bill in its current form is certainly an improvement on the existing situation, but we will not vote in favour of ad hoc amendments which are made subsequently or which are sought to be made at the committee stage. That is out of the question. Sri Lanka is faced with the worst economic crisis since its independence. Who in your view should be responsible for this? I don't think it's fair to point the finger at one person and say that that person alone is the sole architect of the disaster. Uh, there are many people who contributed uh, over the years. Uh, but what is important is not to name people but to identify uh, what really caused it. Not, not so much who caused it but uh, what aspects of their behavior led to this crisis. Uh, the first was arrogance, mm -hmm. not being willing to listen to any other point of view, not being willing to take the advice of experts, for instance on the fertilizer issue. Right? Uh, there were many people who knew the subject, uh, who uh, advised very strongly against the method that was sought to be adopted, not the policy itself, but obviously it can't be done overnight. And um, uh, those views were articulated with great uh, clarity and persuasive power. But um, uh, those in authority turned a deaf ear. They were not willing to listen. So I would say that the crisis is a product of two qualities, a combination of two qualities. One is unawareness. Uh, and the second is unawareness combined with obstinacy, with stubbornness. It was a combination of the two that proved deadly. And uh, that is why we are plunged into the crisis in which we now find ourselves. Um, so anti-corruption was a key demand of the protests. Hmm. But it's not just one, corruption is not just limited to one political party or one government, but consecutive governments have had members misusing power and abusing power and authority. How do you suggest we eliminate corruption? By a variety of methods. One mm -hmm. method alone will not do. Of course, you have to tighten up the laws governing corruption. They are at the moment very inadequate. Uh, for instance, I think it would be necessary to prescribe minimum sentences for corruption. Usually the law prescribes only the maximum sentence. But very harsh minimum sentences should be prescribed. The other major change that is required is we have been focusing so far very sharply on the taker of the bribe, normally a politician, but what about the giver of the bribe, right? So uh, two sides to the coin. Mm -hmm. uh, the laws governing abetment will have to be strengthened in order to bring into the net of liability not only the person who takes a bribe but also the person who entices. Uh, the receiver. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are various other changes that are required uh, in the law. But changes in the law alone will not be sufficient. Uh, this has a lot to do with uh, public opinion. Mm -hmm. We have today a situation where people who have been convicted by the courts, high court has convicted leading politicians right, of embezzlement, for example, uh, of uh, through threats, using the authority of his office, uh, extorting money from business people and so on. Uh, now, those people continue to be in office. So what is the message that uh, that sends the community? That it really doesn't matter. This is acceptable behavior. So what is the use of tightening the laws, prosecuting people, getting convictions in the courts? The judges have convicted them. And then life goes on. They continue in public office. In no country in the world, in no democratic country, would that happen? I mean, the least that would happen is somebody who is convicted of uh, a serious crime, at a very minimum, is asked to resign from office. Indeed. But it doesn't happen in Sri Lanka. So, so long as that situation continues, that, that is impunity. And then people who don't take bribes uh, ask themselves, uh, why should we not enrich ourselves as well? 
if colleagues who are doing it are prospering and are not suffering any adverse consequences, right, are allowed uh, to continue in office, then the conviction becomes established uh, in the country that this behavior is acceptable. So you can do whatever you like with the law, but so long as uh, that situation continues, I don't think that we are going to make any progress whatsoever uh, with regard to not, not the elimination, but even the reduction of corruption in our society. Did you voice out your concerns about people like that in Parliament? Yeah, those concerns have been voiced not only in Parliament, but uh, look at editorials in the newspapers, letters to the editor, interventions by professional associations like the Bar Association, the Organization of Professional Associations. Uh, one of the very refreshing features in Sri Lanka today uh, are the active interventions of uh, medical professionals. University teachers, occupants of chairs of medicine in our universities and so on, they have been very vocal and active in the recent past. And they have uh, expressed their views without fear or favor. But unfortunately, they have not been taken seriously. It has not had uh, an impact on the ground. People should vote for politicians based on policies and values, but that doesn't seem to happen often in Sri Lanka. Where are we going wrong? No, we have, well, that relates to the answer that I gave earlier also. Now, often the electorate votes for people who are known to be corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's not that the voter does not know. The voter knows that, uh, you know, some of the people coming forward at elections uh, have uh, a very checkered history, a tarnished past. But yet they vote for them. And yet they vote for it. So then what can be done about it? Because uh, elections are free and fair. And one of the basic principles of democracy is that uh, votes are counted, not weighed. So every vote has equal value. Uh, therefore, if uh, the voter thinks that uh, ethical or moral standards are irrelevant, then very little can be done. But then uh, to rectify that situation, what you need is uh, a widespread program of public education where you try to instill these values in the public mm -hmm. and uh, until that happens the legislature can pass laws those laws can be applied by the courts but at the end of the day you will not see any noticeable difference unless and until the public becomes sensitive to the need uh, to observe these values in practice certainly uh, when they cast their preference votes at elections. Uh, that, I think, uh, is very essential. Before we move on to the final question, I'd like to know, as a parliamentarian and with the wealth of knowledge and experience you have, if there's any piece of advice you could give to the president of Sri Lanka, what would it be? Well, it's not for me to advise the president, but I think he, if he wishes to carve out a legacy for himself, and to be remembered for something worthwhile. I mean, he's been in politics for, what, 45 years, something like that. So naturally, he would like to leave behind uh, a memory that uh, he could be proud of. The first thing to do, if it is his aim and objective to achieve that uh, uh, result, then I think he must uh, break free from the stranglehold of the portal. He must have uh, freedom of action, freedom of judgment. He must be in a position to make up his own mind and to do what he thinks is right. That's not the position today. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was keen on appointing 38 state ministers in a situation where most people in the country are struggling to have one square meal a day. The World Food Program and other organizations have painted a realistic picture of the pathetic situation in the country with regard to child malnutrition, for example. Right? So in that situation where the people are deprived of their basic necessities, food, food security, uh, fuel security, access to medicines, including life-saving medicines, you know, those are the dire straits in which people find themselves. Now, in that situation, is it reasonable to appoint 38 state ministers? President Gotabaya Rajapaksa ran the country for more than a year without any state ministers at all. Now, I don't think 
the president was very keen on making these appointments, but he had to succumb to pressure from the people who control it. So I think if he, if he wants to leave a worthwhile imprint on contemporary history, the first thing is to break loose uh, from that stranglehold that is an albatross around his neck and to acquire freedom of action to uh, act according to his conscience. All right, moving on to the final question. What are your views on the propo uh, what are your views on the recent UNHRC sessions held in Geneva? Do you think, I mean, has any leader in Sri Lanka worked towards building that transparency and accountancy, accountability? No, the, the most important uh, issue there is credibility. You mustn't give the Human Rights Council or indeed any other international or national institution a promise which you do not intend to keep. Right. And if you give a promise, you must faithfully fulfill that promise. Mm -hmm. The basic problem is an erosion of credibility. Now, you know that as uh, Sri Lanka's foreign minister at that time, as recently as in June this year, I gave a solemn undertaking to the United Nations Human Rights Council that there would be a moratorium on the application of the Prevention of Terrorism Act. President Gotabe Rajapaksa wanted me to do that. Right? Uh, so we said the PTA is not acceptable in its present form. We have already made some urgent amendments. But we propose to subject the entire legislation to a comprehensive review. And until that is done, we will not use the PTA. We gave that solemn promise that is on record. What did we do next? Not only did we break that promise, we broke it uh, flagrantly, but we applied the PTA to situations which have absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. People exercising their basic democratic rights were rounded up, arrested under the PTA. Then how can you expect the Human Rights Council to take you seriously when you make promises for the future? For example, the Sri Lankan government at the current session, the 51st session, which was over on the 7th of October, gave a promise that we would set up a local truth-seeking mechanism, mm -hmm. a far-reaching promise. But do we expect anybody to take that seriously? Because the natural rejoinder would be, what did you do with the previous promise? Did you keep that promise? If you didn't keep that promise, what makes you think that we would believe that your next promise would be kept. So the, the fundamental issue is credibility. If your word is not taken because of your previous track record, we can't complain. Mm -hmm. If we have broken promise after promise, and that is our track record, we can't blame the international community or anybody else for treating our promises with a pinch of salt. So th there is a need for self-criticism for introspection, not simply to hurl abuse at other people, but to ask ourselves where we have gone wrong, and then not with the intention of blaming anybody, but simply to ensure that we identify the mistakes that we have made in the past and we do not repeat them in the future. All right. We have come to the end of this conversation. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of another conversation. Do stay tuned. I will be back with another episode. Um, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Like, comment um, if you like the video and leave your comments and feedback. Thank you everyone for watching. Take care, stay safe and God bless.